Good evening and welcome to Iron Government, a production of the Agency for Public Information. I'm Sheridan Lewis. This evening, Prime Minister Gonzalez addresses members of Parliament on the issue surrounding five Garifuna men who were held captive in Honduras. Director of NEMO, Michelle Forbes, tackles matters relating to the 2020 hurricane season. The Ministry of Agriculture continues its efforts in dealing with the decline in citrus fruits here caused by the citrus greening disease. And we hear from the Registrar and CEO of the Caribbean Examination Council about this year's examinations. These stories will follow Newswatch. Let's head to the news desk at this time to join the API's Jenny St. Philip. Good evening. This is News Watch. I am Janice St. Philip. The Sandals Resort International has now secured funds to the government for purchase of the former Bukama Resorts to the tune of 17 million US dollars. The International Resort is paying for the former Bukament Bay Resort as well as additional lands in the area, including those that the state is taking from farmers. By the end of November, that money should come back to us from Sandals in accordance with the agreement which we have. They don't pay the 10% the deposit already. There are two ways we can, we can do this bridging loan, bridging money. We have some money available to us at the central bank, we can take that and pay that for, the, for that short period of time. Or we can just borrow for the short period of time as a bridging from the Bank of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The Prime Minister addressed the issue on NBC Radio earlier this week. Government is now providing additional subsidy for dialysis treatment at the Modern Medical Complex in Georgetown. Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzales on Wednesday, August 12th, 2020, said that the cost for dialysis is now 150 EC dollars, whereas the previous treatment fee was 250 EC dollars, which was also subsidized by the government. The center, in addition to providing dialysis, also covers free chemotherapy sessions for cancer patients. Since the complex was opened in July 2018, it has done extensive life-changing surgeries and has become a major healthcare hub for the entire nation. In keeping with government's efforts to conserve and protect the environment, the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment has banned the use of plastic in the consumer industry. Therefore, no person shall provide food either on or off the food premises in a disposable plastic food service container. A person shall not distribute, sell or use disposable plastic shopping bags after August 1, 2020. Failure to comply will result in a person being subject to a $5,000 fine and further fined $500 daily if the offence continues. Environmental health officers will be visiting food businesses to ensure compliance. Minister of Foreign Affairs Sir Louis Straker announced on Wednesday, August 12, 2020, that St. Vincent and the Grenadines intends to establish diplomatic relations with Kenya. This diplomatic move was encouraged by Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonsalves' call at the 14th Summit of the African Unit, AU for the African populace to strengthen ties with Latin America and the Caribbean. St. Vincent and the Grenadines has been at the forefront of encouraging a deepening of ties with the African Union. Today, we achieved yet another important milestone in our foreign policy as a still young nation as we consolidate and formalize our relationship with the Republic of Kenya. 
Today we signed the instrument to formally establish diplomatic relations with the Republic of Kenya. However, our active engagement with this Republic, and indeed with the countries on the continent of Africa, are not new. This country already has diplomatic ties with 23 African countries. Thank you for watching. This is News Watch. I am Janice St. Philip. Stay tuned as the API's Iron Government program continues with Sheridan Lewis. The spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. Follow these simple steps. Remove all jewelry before washing hands. Wet hands using running water. Place liquid soap in hand. Circulate using rotational movements, interlace fingers and repeat switching hands. Wash back of fingers rotating them in the palms. Wash fingertips rotating them in palms. Wash thumbs using rotational movements. Thoroughly wash hands down to the wrist. Rinse hands. Dry with clean tissue. Turn off tap using tissue. Use tissue to open door and discard in bin. A simple act can make a huge difference. Stop the spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. This is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. Welcome back. Parliament convened earlier today and Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzales, in his ministerial statement spoke on the issue of five Garifuna men who were held captive in Honduras. Dr. Gonzales noted that given the historic links between St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Garifuna diaspora, this is a matter which goes beyond borders. Also making ministerial statement was Minister of Agriculture, the Honorable Sabuto Caesar. Caesar spoke on the issue of farm workers in Canada. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the Canadian Farm Workers Program. This country has approximately 400 workers who participate annually on the OECS's Farm Workers Program in Canada. We also have hundreds of other workers all over the world, Mr. Speaker. A situation regarding accommodation arose in Canada on a particular farm in Prince Edward Island, where there were 18 Vincentian farm workers. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, arranged for hotel accommodation to be made available to the impacted workers. Three persons took the offer. The matter is being addressed between the OECS Liaison Office, the SVG Consulate in Toronto, the farm owners, and the Department of Labor in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Labor, will continue to be vigilant, continue to work with our consulate, the OECS's liaison office and the Canadian authorities as we work together to ensure the best for our workers. All situations, Mr. Speaker, affecting our workers will be dealt with swiftly. I'd like to draw to the attention of the Honourable House an initiative of the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines in respect of the defense of the rights of the Garifuna people, particularly arising from the kidnapping of five Garifuna men in Honduras. 
I am, in fact, I was just a few minutes late this morning because I was addressing this matter with the, our permanent representative at the United Nations. The two letters which I've written, Mr. Speaker, and the letters are self-explanatory, and I would indicate what is being followed up and what the government intends to do further. I wrote a letter on the 1st of August, 2020, to His Excellency Juan Orlando Hernandez, President of the Republic of Honduras. The letter reads, Your Excellency, the subject, kidnapping of five Garifuna men in Honduras. It has been brought to my attention as Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Chairman of the Caribbean Community that five Garifuna men were kidnapped from their homes in Triunfo de la Cruz, Honduras, in the early hours of July the 15, 2020 or thereabouts. They have not been heard from or seen since that time. This matter has been reported in the global media and has led to public protests in Honduras and elsewhere. These protests are likely to escalate unless the Honduran authorities respond robustly to ensure the return of these five persons safely to their families and to bring to justice the perpetrators of this abduction and to reverse the process of the denial of the fundamental rights and freedoms of the Garifuna people in Honduras in accordance with the Constitution of the Republic of Honduras and international law. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, currently a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, intends to raise the abduction of the Garifuna men and the just cause of the Garifuna people at the United Nations. As you are probably aware, the original and spiritual home of all Garifuna people is Uremin, now known as St. Vincent and the Grenadines. There remains a special bond arising from historical and contemporary circumstances between St. Vincent and the Grenadines and our Garifuna brothers and sisters the world over, but especially in Honduras, Belize, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. The reports of the kidnapping indicate that armed assailants dressed in police clothing, arrived in three vehicles and went house to house, forcing the men into vehicles at gunpoint. It is reported in the prestigious British newspaper, The Guardian, that, quote, the vehicles did not have license plates, and which is a tactic used by both Honduran state security forces and criminal gangs, unquote. The abduction of the Garifuna Five comes against the backdrop of wi widespread violations of the rights of the Garifuna people, including their ownership rights to ancestral lands. For the record, the five kidnapped Garifuna men are Albert Snyder Centeno Thomas, a 27-year-old community activist who has advocated for the Honduran government to compensate the Garifuna people for stolen land. Milton Joel Martinez Alvarez, Swami Aparicio Mejia, Junior Rafael Juarez Mejia, and someone called Mamba, but whose full name is yet to be confirmed. I should point out that this is not merely an internal matter for Honduras. This is an international human rights issue. Honduras has long been a country which subscribes to international norms, laws, and international organizations, which, among other things, have as their guiding commitments a respect for individual rights and the rule of law. The lawless and criminal campaign against the Garifuna people and their leaders in Honduras must stop. I'm sure that you would agree with me on this. Please be assured that St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and by extension, the Caribbean community, are prepared to work with your government to address the plight of the Garifuna people in Honduras. Immediately, though, we need to know urgently what is happening to the case of the kidnapping of the Garifuna Five. Justice must be done. All the best to you, your family, your government, and the people of the Republic of Honduras. 
Sincerely yours, Ralphie Gonzalez, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Chairman of CARICOM. This letter was sent to all the heads of government and the heads of state and of government to CARICOM and to the CARICOM Secretary General and the Director General of the OECS. A few days later, Mr. Speaker, on August the 6th, I wrote this letter to His Excellency Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations. Your Excellency, subject, kidnapping of five Garifuna men in Honduras. Solidarity greetings from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Attached is a letter which I have written to the President of Honduras. The contents of the letter are self-explanatory. I draw this vital international human rights issue to, uh, to your attention and request that you cause an appropriate report to be done by the Secretariat for possible further action. There is simply too much injustice done to minority ethnic or disadvantaged groups in the world. Only the United Nations and its various institutions are available in some circumstances to correct injustices and right certain historic wrongs. This is one such case. Please let us keep in touch on this. All the best to you, your family, and the United Nations. Sincerely yours, Ralph, Prime Minister St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Mr. Speaker, these letters were dispatched to our Ambassador at the United Nations, Her Excellency Inga Ronda King, and she sent these letters to all other, all other 192 governments. I asked her to ensure that it's personally delivered to the Ambassador of the Republic of Honduras so that it would get to the President's Shunes. That was done. I also asked her which she has done to keep in particular close contact with the governments of the, the ambassadors at the UN of Belize, Nicaragua, and Guatemala. The, the Garifuna Inter International Organization has also been in touch with me and I with them. And we intend to raise this matter at the further, the highest levels at the United Nations. It has been raised at the level of the Secretary General. We we'll raise it in other fora at the United Nations, including the, the General Assembly, the International Human Rights, United Nations Human Rights Council, also, possibly, as a security question at the Security Council. This morning I learned, Mr. Speaker, that the, well, no word has come yet as to the whereabouts of these five men who were kidnapped, and that Sections of certain forces in Honduras have been going to the families of the kidnapped men to threaten them. So their own safety now comes into, into question and, and um, it's a matter on which I'm in liaison with relevant persons. Mr. Speaker, we in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the rest of the community, Caribbean community, must work at, as one on, 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 the, on this matter. You're viewing the API's Ion Government presentation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our staff meeting. We'll now have the minutes of the last meeting. <laughs> Miss Peters, you don't know it's bad manners to cough and don't cover your mouth. Well, listen, I have a common cold, and at some point, it is expected that I'm either going to cough or sneeze. So you all don't have to be that dramatic. 
but we don't know if it's cold or COVID. Some people like be wrong and strong. Imagine you cough and don't cover your mouth, and because people talk is a problem. Well, no wonder COVID spreading like wildfire across the world. None of you can give me all the virus in here, you know. Is that a practice good hygiene or I stay at home? I ain't able. Well, seeing that you know so much about proper hygiene in like no mina. What do you mean? It's common knowledge. If you have to cough or sneeze, you cover your mouth with a tissue or the cuff of your elbow so that the virus won't spread in the atmosphere. That's it. It's not rocket science. Okay, Miss Know It All. Now I know better, I will do better. Remember, it's not about who knows it all. Our health is a shared responsibility. For our next staff development session, I'm going to ask a medical doctor to discuss respiratory hygiene with us. So let's get back to our meeting. Thanks for staying with us. Preparations for the 2020 hurricane season continue in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, even as the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, navigates the turbulence of COVID-19. In the following interview, the API's director, Jennifer Richardson, speaks with director of NEMO, Michelle Forbes, about preparations for the 2020 hurricane season amidst COVID-19. We heard earlier before the hurricane season started and well, we must remind our audience that the hurricane season starts on June 1st. June 1st, November the 30th. Right. So before the hurricane season, we heard the predictions that this season was forecast to be very a very busy season. We have seen some name storms, quite a number of them. What can you tell us? I'm, I'm hearing now that the forecast has been revised can you tell us you know what um is in store now what they're saying initially at, before the start of the hurricane seasons you have an early um forecast from around april from the um, forecast agencies like the colorado university um then later on you will have the national hurricane center putting out their forecast and they were very similar in that we were always expecting an active season or above average season. Last week the National Hurricane Center um, put out a revised forecast, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Agency, and indicate that it's going to be an, an extremely active season. And it's already active because we are now in August and we have already had nine named storms. Normally in a, in a typical year, on average year, you may go to a ninth, your ninth storm may be forming around October, thereabouts. So in this case, it has been forecasted to be extremely active. Not just that, because the atmospheric conditions, the sea conditions, the air temperatures, the sea temperatures are quite conducive for formation of tropical cyclones. And in this case, tropical cyclones in the Caribbean or in the Atlantic basin mean a tropical storm or hurricane so the, the conditions are there conducive the we have seen the Sahara dust moving up, uh, out a bit um, from the atmosphere there's still some around but as the as the Sahara dust clears up then the atmosphere becomes a bit more conducive or the environment is ripe as you want to say um, for formation of systems or tropical systems normally in the hurricane season under normal conditions the awareness would be heightened, we'll be hearing a lot more about the, the hurricane season, prepare yourself, do this, do the next, do the other. But because we are in the hurricane season, in the midst of a global pandemic, and because of the infectious rate of the, the, the pandemic we have now, the COVID-19, a lot of persons are caught up with COVID-19, they're paying attention to that, and they are not paying as much attention as they should regarding the hurricane season and what the possibilities are. What are your concerns about that and what should people really be doing at this time? We still have to maintain that whole vigilance around the COVID-19 um, um, virus and the pandemic because of the, in, the high infectious rate as you indicated. But we also cannot let our cards down because we are only two and a half months into the, into the hurricane season and we have to live with the COVID. Um, we have to operate still in a COVID environment along with the hurricane season and other hazards that may be and threats that may, that may face um, our population. So it's not, I don't think you can downplay either. But we have to remember that the devastating impacts, what can actually happen in a hurricane or storm, can be even more devastating than, than um, you know, the infectious rates, for example, in, 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 our, in our country. Have the, the, 
we have not seen people dying from from the COVID-19 um, virus, but other countries have. Um, thankfully, that has not happened here, and we don't want it to happen. So persons, I still think persons are not paying a lot of attention to the COVID, in my opinion, mm -hmm. because we see persons are still not uh, gathering in the mask, gathering, not wearing masks. And for this year, because we have to plan with the COVID-19 um, virus in mind, we have had to implement procedures, new procedures, for example, for entering the, the hurricane shelters, um, the emergency shelters, and we are going to adhere strictly to the Ministry of Health guidelines. And for example, you're entering an emergency shelter um, 2020, you must come with a mask. You, once you're in the shelter, once you're not sleeping, you have to wear your mask at all times. You have to stay within your family structure. You have to stay at a, at a particular distance apart from each other. If you know you have been in quarantine, you have to indicate that you ask you try not to go to an emergency shelter, make arrangement with other with other friends or family without um, putting them at risk at the same time. But if you have to go to an emergency shelter, we now have to create a different space for you um, to be in quarantine. If you are a positive active case, you will not be allowed in the sh in the shelter. But you have to make the Ministry of Health will be making arrangements with those persons who are, are positive. So if right now we need we want to encourage persons we're in a COVID environment, you have to assess your own situation, especially if you're a positive case, and know that okay, is my home capable or is my home structurally sound to withstand a storm or hurricane? If not, we encourage you to get in touch with the Ministry of Health and there will be, be discussions we have had with the Ministry of Health that they will be making alternative arrangements for persons who are actually positive and that they can be housed elsewhere so do not mix with the general shelter population but if you're in quarantine or you come to the shelter we will be doing a vigorous health check in terms of your temperature checks at all emergency shelters there will be temperature checks there will be a more um more questions in terms of your health your, your health status whether you have a cold we will you'll be separated from the rest of the population if you have any cold like symptoms because you just don't know um what that person may have so those are the kind of measures that we are we have been put, we are putting in place for the 2020 um, atlantic hurricane season and it may, be, it may now become the norm going into emergency shelters in the future so those are the kind of things we have to look at so it's not that i i Yes, people are caught up with COVID, but I think we have to be um, caught up with it because of the high rates of infection. But in the meantime, we have to take those same, same precautionary measures into the hurricane season and we, as we're going to peak in, peak in the next month or so. Okay. Now, NEMO deals with disaster management, preparedness, mitigation, I mean, the, the, and also recovery and all of those things after a disaster. And... COVID has a potential to become uh, a national disaster if um, people are not careful, if they don't pay attention to the protocols, if we basically don't do what the health authorities said we should do. And the hurricane season presents another potential for a disaster. If in the midst of the hurricane season, let's say we have a, a hurricane, for example, and people have to be moved to shelters and someone is discovered at a shelter, with COVID-like symptoms, what happens? They are immediately quarantined and separated from the rest of the um, shelter population. The protocol will be that the, the Ministry of Health is informed right away once that person exhibits any type of symptoms and they are, are separated from the rest of the population in the shelter. And of course, if, if in the need that they need to be removed, they'll be moved to another, another facility. What is our state of readiness right now as far as the hurricane season is concerned? Are we ready? to deal with the hurricane should we have should we be hit tomorrow we focus on preparing for all hazards all year round so for us it's not only about the hurricane season it's being a constant state of readiness and that is what we encourage every Vincentian to be in a constant state of readiness and preparedness begins with each and every one of us and we have to take that own, our own sense of responsibility that in, in being prepared as a state organization, organizations that make up the border NEMO, we have been constantly working together. I mean, this year has, because of the pandemic, we have not been able to carry out some of our programs, especially public education part of it, where we do a lot of community work that has had to be curtailed because of the, um, the um, reducing of the social and the mass gatherings in terms of having community consultations um, and the likes. But Oh, we are always in a constant state of readiness because we, it's not about hurricanes for us alone. We work, with, we work with other agencies, we work with different hazards. We have been working with the Ministry of Health, for example, for years, from, from the time we had Ebola and other, other, pan, other possible um, 
epidemics or pandemics that you may have. We now see, we now have seen increased um, cases of dengue. We have to look at that too in in the in the hurricane, in the whole hurricane environment because you know once you have more rainfall, once the temperatures are warmer, it's a more breeding ground for the mosquitoes, more more standing water for the mosquitoes to breed. So these are all the things that when you when you when you speak about disaster management, not just about a hurricane or a storm. It's a it's a it's a complex environment. So we, um, I think it's the first time we are seeing the kind of complexities um, with the pandemic. But we have to ensure that we are as state agencies, we are constantly in or we are in a state of readiness at all times. So we have put on you know every year we do certain things. Every year we inspect the shelters, ensure we have the list of shelters. Um, this year has been a little bit challenging in that many of the private shelters, which are churches, some have declined for be for being emergency shelters for 2020 because they too are a bit scared of the of the um, whole right. the whole COVID and they do not want to be exposed to that environment and we have to respect that too but we want to thank all those shelters and all the all the churches and all the private shelters and the schools and the Ministry of Education who have agreed for the buildings to be listed as, as emergency shelters um, in the past and going forward but we still have to continue to work on having more emergency shelters in some areas where some, where some of the buildings or the owners have declined so that is one thing that we do so we we still doing our public education via our social media we're partnering with different groups who may be having some activities though on a small scale to see how we can actually spread the message and spread the word in terms of your own individual readiness and state organizations our committees have have been meeting to ensure that they did to the various agencies that make up NEMO um, are in a state of readiness and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs the Ministry of Health um, Braxton and a few other agencies that are critical in the whole disaster management activities, not just in the response in the whole planning, because if you do not plan before, then your response doesn't um, does not measure up because you have to put that planning in long before before the actually impact of the of the storm, the rains, the winds, or the hurricane. Okay, now with, within the past year, we have seen the opening of a number of satellite warehouses. And we know that there are community groups that are managing these satellite warehouses. How prepared are these community groups for the, the hurricane season and for other disasters that may, that may come that they need to respond to? Okay, so far we, we have had five satellite warehouses being operationalized. Um, we have, over the, this year in particular, we had operationalized the one in Mespo and Union Island and before that we would have had um, Georgetown, Sandy Bay and Belmont Rose Hall and Beckway is pretty much completed. Uh, we just have to do a final sign off with the Ministry of Economic Planning on that and the warehouses are managed by the district disaster committees within those areas and they're pretty much repa um, prepared because we have to ensure that they have adequate supplies even now with the with the arrival of um, additional PPEs and and gloves and and masks, we're ensuring that the district warehouses have these have these items also, so that even the Ministry of Health can can be able to access them when if if needed. And I want to give an example. It's not about the hurricanes, as I keep saying. For example, when we had that fire in Union Island a few months ago, the district disaster committee there they were able to activate, you, you were able to deploy their cots and so on to use to to manage the situation and actually coordinate on the ground for us in Union Island and many persons don't re didn't realize that but they're on the ground and be able to feed back to us what was happening and give us a you know a situation report on what was happening on the ground and be able to lend their support using some of the equipment that we have within the warehouse there and that is what we we expect we um, normally before a storm we, we check in with each um, each district to ensure that they, uh, you know, check the supplies. We check it ourselves because overall management um, falls on the Nemo, but we ensure that we have certain supplies at the at the various satellite warehouses because if any area get, gets cut off, and you know, some of the key areas, especially in Sandy Bay and um, Warsaw, the further communities, you have to ensure that there's enough supplies so that the other communities, because it doesn't feed the immediate community only, it feeds the wider the wider area within that district. Finally, as individuals prepare, and I'm zooming in here on the hurricane season, what is your advice for homeowners, business owners, persons who need to secure properties, etc.? What's the advice for them at this time? Should, should they still be preparing or should, should they already be prepared? 
preparedness is continuous. I mean, um, mm -hmm. there are little things that you see that you can do all the time. And even before the start of the hurricane, yes, we're in the hurricane season now, but people are still doing construction. People are doing little things. Um, and I think even the last few weeks, we have had some instances where we would have had some rainfall, some gusty winds, and you're seeing people house roofs are actually start lifting off because they're not being um, constructed properly. So there's construction going all, gone on all year round, and I want to make an appeal to persons who are doing construction, whether it's an addition, whether it's a new house, to ensure that you adhere to the building codes. When you're constructing, construct, construct your roof especially properly. Make sure that you have the adequate steel and, all, and, and in, in, the, in your building, because we are seeing too many of these instances where work is not being constructed properly. We, drainage is a big issue in and around homes first of all the guttering from your roof if you need to try and control that water off your roof so that it doesn't undermine your property because that's one of the biggest you see the water in your roof is not come off your roof and it's not controlled so wherever it falls it continues to undermine that that particular property control your runoff and let it go into 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 a drain if you have drains around you that that tends to get blocked up don't sit and wait on someone else to do it it is your property that is going to be flooded if you know you have been flooded in the past pay particular attention to where you live in st vincent we know we have been impacted by landslides and floods for quite a number of years those are the two main threats we have each year even if you may not have a storm you know you're going to get the heavy rainfall and you know you may have gusty winds from time to time so the landslides and flooding of that were more prevalent hazards or threats that we that we we face or um throughout the year pay attention to whether you live below a bank you live on top of a bank you live near a river you live near a drain you live near the sea and you know if you live if you lived in those areas that once there's going to be heavy rainfall you know the possibility of flooding or landslide may occur if you know you live near to the coastal areas you know that once a storm or hurricane come the storm surge is going to come and it can impact you know where you're going to go it doesn't have to be an, an emergency shelter make arrangements with family and friends now you can make that arrangement long before so that you know where you're going to go and not just that even if your family gets separated you know that that's your meeting point that you're going to go and share with um with those family and friends have your supplies too often you people wait until the last day uh, some morning is given the prime minister has given the um given the instructions to shut down and everybody rushed to the supermarket yes i know there are persons who are living from a day to day but try to always have a few little things um stored so that you know you will have it if, if there's an emergency two to three days supply a full minimum and in the whole covid environment we're asking persons to have things for longer two weeks um two weeks now basically because 14 days in case you have to quarantine also um 14 days of supply of food if, if you can and if you're going to the emergency shelters most importantly you take your food for supply for two to three days too many times we are seeing that um we have been we have been so accustomed to the reliant um, supply of water, for example, from our water authority, so that when we lose water for a day, we're making a lot of noise. But we need to go back to those old days where we had our pots and our buckets filled with water, so that when the water go for a day or even two days, that you are not so much left, you know, crying, oh, I need, you know, I need some water. You know, so back to those things, make sure you have your battery operated lanterns. We, we have, we, I don't know if you can remember, see any house um, of late that had a battery operated radio. Many don't. I do. You know, many, you know, <laughs> many don't. I'm telling you, many don't have a, a battery operated radio. You need to have backup for your phone system. You need to make sure your, your, your vehicle has enough gas. You make sure you have your medicines, especially for your children. Your, your, your older parent, persons in the home, the pampers, you know, your sanitary pads and all these things that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think we need to look also back at our survival techniques and skills that we would have lived by many years ago. And I say this for example, you know, I always like, I have been making this, a, a few years ago we had a family who would have suffered um, tr um, some damage and they went to the emergency shelter just with a bag of roast bread fruit and the people were like where are they going with all these roast bread fruit but that was their survival mechanism they roast all these bread because they know they can't have fried bread fruit 
they you know they said uh, if later on they could have had uh, get the uh, money to buy some chicken they could have used the chicken and breadfruit they could have do uh, so many things with the breadfruit and we need to go back to some of the some of the items that we have that can last the ground provision even if you if we have strong winds and a banana or a planting blow down you can use them but if it's a flood it's a different type of environment once flood water goes on anything you cannot use them again so you know so we have to look at these survival how do how can our food last a little longer how can we utilize our natural foods in, a, in an emergency environment to sustain us so there's quite a bit of things we can do but I want to make preparing for emergency begins with each and every one of us as a state agency we are here to ensure that the that the state has a has a preparedness and a management plan so that government can continue we can pick up the pieces we can actually be able there to lend assistance or show support to persons who have have been impacted um, from a particular em emergency and even now going into the as we're in the COVID environment, one of the things that we are focusing on is on the psychosocial support that has been big throughout the COVID-19 response. And we want to really maintain that kind of support throughout all emergencies. Yes, we have had it in the past, but even more so now, it is needed because we are dealing with different complexities, as I said, multiple different hazards impact that, that can affect families, a social socioeconomic situation now, um, compound with an emergency. When you have, when you're out of work and you may be, may lose, you lose everything. So these are the kind of complexities as what the social and the physical that we have we have to manage in, in this new environment well said and on that note we will end just so you know that we are in the hurricane season we're in the COVID season we have no idea how long that will last though we have an end date for the hurricane season we do not have an end date for the COVID and we need to be prepared follow the protocols do take every necessary precaution that we can so i want to thank you again michelle for joining us thank you for listening and have yourselves a good evening iron government will be right back stay with us Marine and Coastal Rehabilitation Adaptation Project. Located south of the island, extending to over five bays, White Sands, Kanash, Kaliakwa, Villa, and Indian Bay. Let's improve aquatic life. A message from the National Parks, Rivers, and Beaches Authority and Partners. Welcome back. Citrus fruits are on the decline in St. Vincent and the Grenadines as a result of the citrus greening disease. The disease is caused by a tiny vector and is said to have originated in Asia. The Ministry of Agriculture with imported citrus material has propagated new seedlings in hope for a stronger variety. Agriculture officer in the Plant Protection Unit, Osborne Laban, is one of the persons on the ground to tackle this disease. So it is Assume that it, it is all over St. Vincent and the Grandines at the present moment. In a 2014 draft Food and Agriculture Organization FAO National Action Plan for Huang Long Bing or HLB management in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, it was said the HLB or citrus greening disease and its vector are well established in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It threatens to destroy the citrus industry, which is already being impacted by other challenges. Citrus greening is really a major disease of um, citrus all over the world. Um, for example, in Florida, and California, it has wiped out hectares of citrus really in California and Florida. In St. Vincent, I'm not seeing such a, an effect, mainly because I believe um, we have isolated patches of citrus production going on in St. Vincent. It's not in a, in a setting where we call it an orchard. So we are quite fortunate um, still for the little citrus that, that um, we had. In 2012, um, in Kianawan, the vector of the disease, which is called the citrus silid, 
the scientific name, the Diaphorina citri, um, was intercepted on citrus in Kianawan. Um, subsequent subsequent to, to that, we did some confirmations and tests and confirmed that the disease that is spread by the citrus psyllid was found in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, right? And that disease is called the, as I said before, the citrus greening, right? Which is a bacterium. I'm gonna describe the adult psyllid um, that is transmitting the disease problem to the citrus. And really the adult you would find between two to three millimeters, um, sometimes smaller. It has a light, brownish color and um, it really sits on the leaf at a 45 degree angle so um, that is one of the identification keys where you can see it sitting at a 45 degree angle feeding on the leaves one thing i should mention to really the insect loves flushes when i say flush it's where the most new part of the plant came out the the new growth that is um what we call the flush, right? Where you have the most soft leaves. What, why I said that really is that the insect is a soft bodied insect and it really has to penetrate the leaves to get the sap out of the leaf because that is what it's doing really. So it has to suck the sap out of the leaf to survive and to lay its eggs. So really it chooses the most vulnerable part of the plant and that is the new shoots, the new growth that is coming from the plant. So whenever you are actually you know, monitoring or looking for the insect, you have to look at the flushes on the citrus, the younger part of the, the plant. If you notice on, on this leaf, for example, once the tree is infected, once the tree is infected, you will notice that half of the leaf or part of the leaf still remains green and the other part is yellow. And the yellowing and the greening is irregular on the leaf, as opposed to, for example, a disease that have a, has a, a plant that has a nutrient deficiency. Um, you will see a, a consistent yellowing on both sides of the leaf. But with this disease, the citrus greening, you would have um, inconsistencies in terms of the, the leaf. Part would be yellow, part would be green. So this is just an example of, of what the symptoms would look like on the tree. In sucking the sap out of the leaf, there's a chance for of toxins from the insect that can cause tip burning on the, the foliage. And then it, it actually causes those that actually survive from the tip burning, it causes a calling. A calling on the leaf and um, that would prevent the tree from really, you know, um, developing. Um, as, for example, in, in its photosynthetic um, um, production. So... That is one of the, the, the damages that it can do to the leaf without transmitting the disease. But the most important thing really, it is the, tran it, it is the vector, what we call the vector of the citrus greening disease, right? The cyan material is the material of the variety that you actually want, uh, right, from a citrus plant. So, for example, if you want a Valencia orange, and a lot of people know about var var um, Valencia orange, you have to use a rootstock that is what I call tolerant, vigorous, vigorous in terms of growth. That is what we use as the material that we place in the earth. But now the material that you, you want as the variety is known as the cyan. So that would be the Valencia that we now are going to propagate on the rootstock, right? So that is called a cyan. Cyan material is the variety that you actually want that you're going to propagate um, to get your, your plant.
So what we are actually looking at in this greenhouse, what we have here are some of the propagated plants that we have done for ourselves from the imported um, cyan material that we actually got from California. So what we have here, as I said before, is a protected structure that keeps out any pests or insects, including the citrus psyllid. And these are our potted plants that we, that we get our varieties from now that we collect our cyan material. Right, so we're actually doing our own cyan material to do our propagation in our greenhouses. Right now, what we have in the greenhouses here, we have a variety of limes, we have a, a variety of oranges, and also grapefruit. So we have the, for example, the Oro Blanco grapefruit, the Paulist grapefruit, we have the Persian lime, we have the Mexican Taunus lime, we have the Valencia oranges, we have the Washington naval oranges. We have a lot of varieties inside the, the greenhouse here. Actually, we have two of these greenhouse set up on the station. This is one of them and the other is at the bottom. And a lot of people like to, you know, bring in plant parts, plant materials that are supposed to actually go through quarantine processes. And some of them don't even reach that, that stage, right? Um, but I'm appealing to people not to, to go this route really because you're going to actually introduce disease into the country that we don't have. We have been living for the past years before citrus greening without any major disease in, in citrus. Living very well. We di didn't have to even fertilize. We didn't have to even do any kind of agronomic practices and we were getting citrus in the long run. So plant parts and plant materials, we are appealing that people don't bring in these... Um, materials into the country because you don't know what is infected from from what is not infected do some research for yourself so at least you'd be on a, a page where you know well when i go there boy this looks something looks wrong here so um I could actually call the the ministry of agriculture and that is my other point if you see anything that is suspicious on your citrus trees and insect that looks suspicious of, of what I've described. Call your extension offices, the plant protection unit, or any part of the Ministry of Agriculture where we can actually come and you know do that investigation and find out what is the problem, you know, with your citrus. Monitoring of your plants is very important because it's through monitoring, um, through surveillance that you're gonna actually find the, the, the problem in terms of the vector, the citrus psyllid, which is actually transmitting this disease. I hope you guys have, you know, have that information now that you can be equipped to deal with the problem out there and in terms of identifying and, and the disease and the pest problems. To win the fight against citrus greening, all hands must be on deck for the survival of this country's citrus industry. Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, I am Keisha Woodley. The API's Ion Government continues in just a moment. Stay with us. Read, learn, grow. The children are the future. Help them read, learn, grow. Early reading is the key, so help them read, learn, grow. Let's show them how much fun it is to read, learn, grow. So parents, you play your part. First and foremost, reading from so young is advantageous. Link with the teachers. Working hand in hand is a must. Just 10 minutes of your child reading to you is a plus. Get fun books, make reading priority. When children read, they are able to learn. And the more they learn, the more they grow. So parents help the kids read, learn, grow. Reading is fun, kids have to know. Read, learn, grow. The children are the future. Help them read, learn, grow. So parents, you play your part. This message is brought to you by the OECS USAID Early Learners Program, funded by United States Agency for International Development. For more information, log on to www.oecs.org slash ELP. Thanks for staying with us. Registrar and CEO of the Caribbean Examination Council, CXC, Dr. Wayne Wesley, has thanked all stakeholders who contributed to the successful execution of exams throughout the region.
In his message, the registrar noted that the modified approach applied in response to the impact of COVID-19 aided in the required level of equivalence for students. Here's more. Good day, especially to our candidates, parents, guardians, teachers, universities, and employers. I would like to use this opportunity to thank the ministries of education, local registrars, teachers, invigilators, and center staff for the successful administration of the regional examinations, especially during this time of COVID-19, and your commitment to the safety and well-being of all stakeholders. Your service to the region and the development of our young people is commendable. In March 2020, when COVID-19 became a reality for the Caribbean, it required organizations, including the Caribbean Examinations Council, to create an alternative strategy to facilitate the advancement of students to the next level in their professional development. In July, the threat of hurricane for a short period affected administration of examinations in the sub-region of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. I am happy, however, to report that we were still able to accommodate those candidates affected, thanks to the collaborative efforts of the Ministry of Education, local registrars, and the CXC. Where candidates in territories were seriously affected by COVID-19 to the extent that they were unable to sit their examinations, these candidates will be allowed to do their examinations at the next available sitting free of charge. At the regional examinations body, the council maintains that grades awarded must be valid, equivalent, and fair. In rethinking the way forward, the Caribbean Examinations Council created a modified approach to the administration, marking, and grading of CSEC and CAPE examinations. A modified approach was also applied to CVQs. The modified approach included the administration of one common paper, the multiple choice paper or paper one, the moderation of all school-based assessments and the administration of the alternative to SBA paper three two for private candidates. Without paper two being administered, the council had to give more careful attention to equivalence. Equivalence means that from year to year, candidates who earn the same grade demonstrate the same level of performance. Here are some points that will assist you in understanding the grading process. The determination of grades will be modeled to account for the performance according to the candidate's competence on each profile. There is no adjustment to weighting of papers since the modified approach being used excluded the paper too. The trends in teacher predictions over the previous years will be used to determine if the grade awarded is fair to the candidates. The council is confident that candidates' performance in 2020 can be compared to past performance trends. The basis of this confidence is that a candidate who is awarded a particular grade in 2020 will have similar characteristics and performance on the multiple choice and SBA papers as a candidate who was awarded that grade in previous years. Therefore, candidates, parents, guardians, universities, and employers can all be confident that the grades earned this year will be no different from the grades that were earned by those candidates who sat the examinations in previous years. Rest assured that the grades this year 
will be valid, equivalent, fair, and have equal status to the grades awarded in previous years. Thank you for listening. May God bless you all. This is where we end yet another Iron Government presentation, a program produced and presented by the Agency for Public Information. For further updates, visit our social media platforms at API SVG. Join us again on Saturday for Inside Story. On behalf of the API production team, thank you for viewing. I'm Sheridan Lewis. Good night.